Hello, my name is Håkon and welcome back to my channel and a little Zoya tutorial today. Uh, and this tutorial is based on a question somebody asked a few days ago uh, in the Zoya Facebook group. And the question was, how do you control a single oscillator with multiple sequences? That is to say, how do you switch between those sequences while playing? And the really basic way to do that is to take the outputs from the sequences put them into a switch, send the output of that switch to the oscillator, and then have some means of changing which of the inputs is sent to the output on that switch. Um, that's the basic way of doing it. And that works, but what happens then is that whenever you switch between the sequences, the change is immediate which means that the new pitch from the new sequencer will change the pitch that might be actually playing that very moment on the oscillator. Um, I will demonstrate that in a moment. First of all, I'm just going to show you what I've got here now. So I've got three five-step sequencers. I could have done more steps, but I just like that for the space. Um, and also I quite like the concept of a five-step sequencer generally. And they all three are gated with the same square wave LFO. So this is connected here to all three gates of these sequences. The outputs of the three sequences go into an in-switch. And just for those who may not be familiar with the Zoya, uh, an in-switch, what that does is it has a number of input channels. It has a channel selector and an output. And only one of the input channels will be sent to the output, and that channel is based on the value of the channel selector. Uh, I'm going to say more about that later uh, when we do some more patching. Um, and then I have three radio buttons here, and um, I'm not going to show you in this tutorial how to patch up radio buttons, but it's a very useful, I think, uh, interface algorithm to use on the Zoya. I use them all the time, and I have made a few tutorials in the past about how to create radio buttons, so I'm going to link to one of those up here. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the term radio button, it means that you have a set of buttons, in this case three, and only one of the whole set can be switched on at any one point of time. Which means that when I switch on the second button here, the first one that was on is now switched off. And the third one, now that goes off as well. So, and this, uh, these buttons are patched up to control which of these three sequences are passed through to the oscillator. Uh, and so it controls the channel selector on the switch. I'm, go I'm not going to say more about that right now, but I will say more about it a bit later. Um, and then we have... Um, let's see... The oscillator here. Uh, there's also down here, there's a sample and hold, uh, which is used to control the connection between these radio buttons and the switch. Um, I'll say more about that later as well. Just I'll just play it for you first what this sounds like. Deliberately though, I did try to make the change between sequences happen in the middle of a step playing. Of course, uh, with a bit of practice and, and of course good sense of rhythm, etc., you may be able to change between the sequences exactly at the right time, so you don't get any kind of glitches. But um, I think um, generally as well, when you work with sequences, it's very useful to have an algorithm that means that the change of pitch of a sequencer, or in this case of a change between sequences, only happens once per step. Now the value that is sent out from the sequencers is constant, 
until it changes. Um, what you can do, which I think is very useful, is to let a sample and hold module control the output from one or several sequences uh, so that the change from one step to the next can only happen once per step. I'm going to demonstrate how to patch that up now um, so that you can do that. Uh, another advantage of doing it that way is that if you want to change your sequences dynamically, uh, for instance with a MIDI controller or manually on the Zoya panel, um, if you are changing the pitch value or the CV value, I should say, of a sequencer, because the sequencer doesn't have to control pitch, um, while the step is playing, um, then of course that change will be patched through to wherever, whatever that sequencer is controlling. So, um, so I'm going to demonstrate that. So what we need then, I'm just going to move now this switch, uh, first of all, to the second page because it's just to make things tidier. Um, and then I will want a sample and hold. I'll make it a different color than what I've got here before. I'm going to make it peach. Um, and so just for to explain for those who may be unfamiliar with this, uh, I know that I have people who watch my Zoya videos who also don't even have a Zoya yet and they're wondering whether this is right for them, what they can do with it, etc. Um, a sample and hold module has three pads. And input, trigger, and output. Um, so what happens is whatever you patch into the input of a sample and hold, um, can change dynamically, it can change as much as you like. It can be an LFO, it can be uh, a button, um, it can be anything. But when the module gets a trigger on the trigger pad, and the trigger on the Zoya is defined as it detects a rising value. So anything you patch into this that suddenly has a rise in value will trigger the sample and hold and when it is triggered, whatever value is at that very moment on the input pad will be copied over to the output pad. And it will stay on the output as a constant until the next time the sample and hold is triggered. So a very useful module. I use them absolutely all the time. Switches, sample and hold, two of my most used modules because they're so useful for any kind of programming algorithm. Um, to control the Zoya and what happens on it. So, so the input I want here on the sample and hold is the pitch value. I'm going to just going to move it over here now. So I want the output. Oops, I didn't do that right. I think my shift button is actually getting a little bit weak again. So, um, so I only want. I want the value uh, coming out from the switch now to be the input on the sample and hold. So this is getting, of course, the sequencer output from the active sequencer, and that, of course, is the output here. And that's the input of the sample and hold, but I will only check what value that is once per step. So uh, the obvious thing to do, I'm going to just patch that up first, is to take the LFO that's controlling the sequencer and put, put that into the trigger pad here. So that now, every time there's a step, it copies the value. And then I will need to remove the connection between the switch and the oscillator. So I'm going to do shift trash can. And then I'm going to patch that up to the sample and hold instead, like so. Let's see what happens now when I play. As you can see now, there are no glitches because the change in pitch only happens once per step and only, and that is what happens just before the note is being played. Now, the very perceptive of you may have noticed something happening now that was different from last time. 
And that is that when the first step lights up, the note value that is being played is actually the one from the last step of the sequencer. You probably missed it, but that is the case. And the reason for that is that now you're using the same trigger to advance the sequencer as for the sample and hold, and because of the delay in the sampling, uh, that means that the sample and hold now actually reads out the value before the new value of that step is sent from the sequencers, or rather from the in switch, because the in switch will add a tiny little bit of delay. So the way we compensate for that, I mean, it's not crucial to the workings of the patch, but if you want the this to line up with what's being played, and that's going to be more relevant for the next step I'm going to show you, um, then you need to delay the triggering of this sample and hold. Uh, and doing that, I'm going to put in a control module, and I'm going to put in, uh, let's see, where is it now? CV delay. Okay. So instead of patching the LFO into the sample and hold directly, um, oh, sorry, the trigger of the sample and hold directly. I'm going to remove that. I'm now going to take the LFO, patch it into a CV delay, and then the output from the CV delay is what is patched into the trigger for the sample and hold. And then I'm going to leave it now at 1.33 milliseconds, that is the lowest delay you can have, and uh, see if you can notice the difference. <laughs> That is the correct order. So now when the step lights up, that is the note that is being played. Um, so that's a good good starting point. So now we have what I think is, is sort of the ideal sequencer setup. You make sure that the steps match up and you can change the value of a sequencer step or you can change between them and they don't get glitches. Now, uh, there is one more scenario that I think is actually quite useful to think of in, in this context, because if you have multiple sequences to control the performance, very often those sequences um, are parts. Um, if you think of it in the pop music sense, you have the verse, you have the chorus, you have the bridge, for instance, and you want to change between those at set times. If you have a setup like this, you have, of course, you have to trigger it at exactly the right time. But if you always want a full sequence to play, there is one more way of doing it, and that is to make the change between sequences not just happen per step, but actually only happen at the end of a sequence. And I think that's also quite a useful thing to show in this context. Um, so the way I want to program that is that I'm going to, uh, one of the ways uh, you can tell maybe the, I'm not sure it's the only way, it's not the only way, uh, there's usually more ways to do things on the Zoya, but one of the ways and maybe the easiest way to tell the Zoya that there's an end of a sequence is to add a new track to one of the sequences. So I'm going to do that. Now I'm going to take the first one, edit it, and I'm going to make this number of tracks two. Uh, oh, yeah. So now I get an extra track. Oh, by the way, uh, while I'm talking about the number of tracks, um, if you have a setup like this with three sequences in parallel, or four sequences, or five, or however many uh, you have, it is possible, of course, to have those three or more sequences be different tracks on a single sequencer module. The reason I don't usually do that, and why I would normally recommend not to do that, is that um, if you want to control the values at the different steps of a sequencer, I find it easier to do manually when I have them separate. And also, if you want to patch something into those steps to change the values, or if you want to control them with a MIDI controller, for instance, which is quite a, a common and likely scenario, then that patching onto these steps will only affect uh, 
the first track of the sequencer. The other tracks are not affected by anything patched into it. They are have to be set manually on the Zoya front panel uh, by going into that track, selecting the step, changing the value with the encoder, uh, which is very inconvenient uh, as the performance, if you have to change them during a performance, if they are meant to be fixed for a specific performance or a song, then that's fine because then you won't accidentally change them. But generally, having sequences as separate modules, I find it visually quite appealing. It's easier to edit um, manually as well, and also you can change them dynamically by patching something into them. So that's what I usually prefer. In this case, uh, the second track of this sequencer is fine because it is going to be just a permanent single thing that is going to be on this track. Um, now, um, the way I want to tell the Zoya that it's the end of the sequence is by sending out a value on the last step. Now I could use the gate sequencer for this uh, by changing, by push pushing the encoder and changing what kind of sequencer it is, but I don't like the way that um, the Zoya behaves when you have a gate sequencer because when you push these it switches the gate on and off, but sometimes it's a bit tricky to see what's on and what's off, and if you want to just select something, then it actually changes the value. So I usually prefer to set my gate sequences also to CV, and then I just set that value to max. Now, um, normally, of course, if I have an actual gate sequence that is meant to work as a gate, I wouldn't control it from the Zoya panel, I would usually use my MIDI controller. If you want to have a live gate sequence that will change the gates, um, then of course it might make sense to have it set as a gate sequencer, so you can just push the panel. Um, normally I would actually use um, some kind of interface for that as well, but yeah, there are many ways of doing this. This is how I prefer it because it is more foolproof, it's not so easy to actually mess up and accidentally switch the step off, etc. So now, every time it gets to the end of sequence here, it will, this thing will light up, like so. Okay, so how do we make the Zoya only change the pitch value that is sent to the oscillator at the end of, no rather, no, how do you, it actually gets a step, of course it gets a pitch value every step, but how does it only change between the different sequences at the end of a sequence, okay? So this is where we have to do some more patching. Um, so at the moment we have these three inputs, of course, uh, are the pitch inputs for the different sequences, and this is now sent to this sample and hold. But what if a change between sequences, and that's to control this, this switch on the in switch, or the, uh, the channel selector on the in switch, I should say, is what we now want to control only once per uh, sequence. Everything else we want to control per step. So how, wh what is controlling this right now is the question, and of course we see this is the sample and hold that is currently connected to these radio buttons. So I'll just move that to the second page as well so we can see what we're doing here. So now every time I push one of the radio buttons, this sample and hold gets a value at the input, and it's triggered. Uh, actually, I'll just show you that now. I'm just going to move that back. Oops, if I can, if my Zoya allows. So every time I push a radio button now, you see this sample and hold lighting up. And I can explain to you now how this works, uh, actually, because that is quite relevant to know. Um, just to go back to the in switch for a moment, the way a switch works, the way the channel selector of a switch works, is it divides one by the number of channels to determine which CV values uh, select which channel. Uh, the CV range of the Zoya is, well, it is from minus one to one, but in most cases it's from zero to one uh, for most modules. So it takes the value range from zero to one, divides it equally between the three inputs. So in a three channel, in switch, um, if the value at the 
channel selector is between 0 and 0 0.3333, or should say if it is below 0 0.333, it will select channel 1. If it is from 0 0.3334 up to 0 0.666, it selects channel 2. If it is above 0 0.666, it, it selects channel 3. So a value of 0 always selects the first channel, a value of 1 always selects the last channel, and then it depends how many channels you have, uh, which are the values you need. So, in order for these radio buttons to control which of these channels is selected, and the way I've done it, and this is quite a useful thing to know about as well, um, is so, well, each of these buttons is connected to this sample and hold, both to the input and to the trigger. Uh, I'll show you with the last one now because this actually has the output visible. So the connection to the trigger is 100%. It doesn't really matter, but it, I like it when it lights up properly, so I give it 100%. It just needs to be a rising value. So each of these three buttons is patched into this uh, trigger with 100% connection strength. But if you look at the um, input of the sample and hold, the last button now gets a connection strength of 100%. And that is because that is meant to select the last channel. But if you look at the input now, actually, shift and I icon, we can see that the UI buttons have three different input strengths or connection strengths. The first button has a connection strength of 33.1, and the second one has a connection strength of 66.1. And if you recognize those numbers, it's because those are very close to the ones I just told you about for selecting a channel on the switch. When I push the first button, it sends out a value of 1, but the connection strength is 33.1%, which means that value becomes 0.331 in the sample and hold, and that's the value that is sent out from this sample and hold to the channel selector, and channel 1 is selected. It could have been 0, but I like to use the value that is closest to the upper part of the range so that it lights up uh, more. I don't like it to be completely dark, then you can't see what's happening because the light, light intensity on the Zoya gives you visual feedback. And, and the same for channel 2 selected when you push button 2. So that's part of how the radio buttons work and how the channel uh, selector works on the in switch. Uh, right, where was I? So yes, I want to... Um, now, I want this switch between the channels to only happen once every sequence. So, I need um, so I need another sample and hold. So, I'm going to do a sample and hold there, control module. Um, sample and hold, where is my sample and hold? There we are, sample and hold. Um, and the input for that is going to be which channel is going to be selected. So I'm going to patch the output from this sample and hold, which selects the channel right now, into this sample and hold. So that means every time I push one of these channel selector buttons here, uh, the value at the input of this sample and hold will change. But it will be triggered by this. So now it should be, if that's, did I patch up? I don't think that patched up, hang on. Uh, so this is, the, the second track of the first sequencer is then going to trigger, that's better, that sample and hold, and so it's only at the end of a sequence that it will register which of these sequences is going to be the one that is being played. And then I'm going to remove the connection from the first sample and hold, like so, and I'm going to use this sample and hold to select which channel is being sent through to the oscillator. Let's see what that sounds like if I patched it up correctly now. Mm -hmm. 
you can see there, actually, I was overdoing it a little bit as well by pushing right quite early in the in the sequence. Now the swapping between these sequences only happens after the whole sequence has played, and then it starts on the next one um, afterwards. Um, and of course, if you push these buttons. Back to where they were, for instance, nothing happens. So if you if you accidentally push the wrong one, you can quickly correct it as well. Um, this little caveat, of course, with this one is that, of course, the changing of the sequence happens exactly when this one lights up, which means that you need to swap the sequence sequences before the last step of the sequence is played. That should be fine to get used to, but for some people that might feel a little bit strange if you're used to triggering something um, on the last step before something happens. If you consistently trigger the correct sequence change always on the last step of the previous sequence, then of course you can use the previous method I showed you and just let it happen once per step. But if you want to do like this, you want to control other things at the same time, and you want to have always have a full sequence play, um, then of course this system I think works really well. So those are three different ways, uh, I guess you could say, of controlling how you swap between sequences while playing. Um, and, and of course they have their pros and cons. Um, I think that some people actually would prefer the first method and actually allow those little glitches to stay in because it is part of the humanity of a performance to have these little mistakes uh, that add flavor, especially if you are working more in a sort of experimental um, electronic uh, kind of paradigm, which I often do. Um, but if you want a sort of tidy, neat performance that is perfectly structured and timed, then the last system of doing it where it only changes at the end of a sequence might be the way to go. So I hope you found this useful um, or inspirational. Um, even if you don't want to do exactly this kind of thing on the Zoya, um, there are a few aspects of how this is done that might be useful for other ways of programming other things on the Zoya. That is one of the great things about it, I think, that um, it is so flexible, but sometimes you just have to think of how to create the algorithm, how to patch it up to get the behavior you want to do, and sometimes you have to think a little bit lateral or outside the box to um, make it behave the way you want, but almost anything is possible as long as it has the CPU for it. So um, I'm not going to show you anything else now. As I said earlier, if you want to know how the radio buttons work, there are separate videos on that. I'm not going to say exactly what the sound production here is like because it's not relevant to what I was trying to show you. Um, I, can, I can just say it briefly now. I have here an oscillator, but I've also got a second oscillator that's connected to it in, um, to the FM input of the other oscillator uh, and it's controlled by two different ADSRs. There's a bit of a reverb. Uh, and um, yeah, so, but that's not important. The main thing now, how do you switch between sequences in three different ways? So if you enjoyed this, uh, please like, share, comment, subscribe, join me on Patreon, uh, buy me a coffee, etc., etc., etc. And I'll see you in the next one. And um, goodbye for now. Bye-bye.